Okay, so now that we've learned about the different intermolecular forces, let's talk about how they manifest in some of the properties of solids and liquids. Let's go ahead and jump into our PowerPoint here. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so um, so we're going to start by talking about solids, and we're going to talk about how things change from solid to liquid and to gas. So when we think about the structure of a solid, what we're really talking about is how those molecules and ions are arranged in three-dimensional space. And what governs the way that they are arranged is those intermolecular forces. And so just to remind you guys, um, we know that the intermolecular forces are related to boiling and melting points. So the stronger those intermolecular forces are, the more tightly together those molecules are gonna be held. And that means they're going to require more energy in order to change states of matter. And so that means that the stronger the intermolecular forces are, the higher the melting and boiling points are going to be. Okay, so let's first talk about molecular solids. So molecular solids are those solids made up of covalently bonded molecules. Within a molecule, you have strong covalent forces. We call those bonds and they are relatively strong and they hold the atoms of the molecule together. When we talk about intermolecular forces, we are talking about those weak forces between two different molecules that hold those molecules together. And because those forces are weak, we know that molecular solids tend to be soft and have low melting points. They're made up of discrete molecules held together only by those intermolecular forces. Those physical characteristics are dependent on the strength of the intermolecular forces. Molecular solids are also generally speaking insulators. They do not conduct electricity. Okay, so the next type we're gonna talk about is what we call covalent network solids. So covalent network solids tend to be very hard and they have high melting points. They do not have discrete molecules. We can think of them as super molecules. These are made up of billions and trillions of atoms all covalently bonded together. So the entire solid is held together with, with covalent bonds, not with intermolecular forces. So examples of these would be things like diamonds or coal. So diamonds are an example of a covalent network solid. We all know that they're extremely hard. It has a very high melting point. Um, and diamond is one of the classic examples of a covalent network solid. It's a network of carbon atoms all covalently bonded together. If we look at graphite, it's a different type of a covalent network solid. So now with graphite, we tend to have sheets of carbon and those sheets are all covalently bonded together. And then there are occasional links between the sheets. And those links are sometimes covalent bonds and sometimes intermolecular attractions or intermolecular forces. And so graphite has fewer covalent bonds. So it's softer. And those sheets tend to slide across one another, which is what makes graphite very useful as a lubricant. Um, and also they rub off of each other fairly easily, which is why graphite is what we use in our pencils. Um, so here's just a three-dimensional view of graphite of diamond um, and then a three-dimensional view of graphite. And you can see that with graphite, you have those distinct sheets that are then bonded together, whereas diamond is all tetrahedrally linked in three dimensions. The one last carbon example that we're going to talk about is something called graphene. And graphene, we can think of as a one atom thick layer of graphite, and it has some really unique and interesting characteristics. It's really strong. It's really light. It's almost transparent. It actually conducts heat and electricity extremely well. Um, and it turns out that graphene is also incredibly strong. So Again, those covalent network bonds make it very strong. When we're thinking about network covalent solids, we wanna think about 
things in the carbon family tend to form network covalent solids. So this would be carbon, silicon, and even to a certain extent, germanium. So when we see those three, we wanna look and see what they're bonded with to determine whether or not that's a network covalent solid. So carbon bonded to pretty much anything besides silicon is gonna be a molecule. So that would be a molecular solid, but carbon bonded to silicon might be a network or probably is a network covalent solid. Silicon bonded to itself or to oxygen also creates a network covalent solid and germanium bonded to silicon or to oxygen can also make a network covalent solid. So just to review our network covalent solids are atoms connected by a network of covalent bonds. So instead of being held together by intermolecular forces, it's being held together by intramolecular forces or bonds. They're very hard, they have very high melting points. Depending on the substance, it may or may not be a thermal or electrical conductor. Okay, so quick review of ionic solids. We remember that in ionic crystals, the ions pack themselves so that they maximize attractions and minimize repulsions. These tend to be very hard, but they also tend to be very brittle because they, um, if we shift, then um, we put solid or positive next to positive and negative next to negative, and we get this brittle repulsion factor. Okay, so again, quick overview: an ion is formed. Ionic solid is formed of alternating positive and negative ions. It's held together by those strong electrostatic attractions that we call ionic bonds. They are hard but brittle. They have very high melting points. They are not very good thermal conductors or electrical conductors, but when they are molten or dissolved in water, then they are exceptionally good electrical conductors. Okay, metallic bonding. We remember that we talk about the chemical bonding that results from the attraction between these uh, charged nuclear cores and the surrounding sea of electrons. And this is formed by all those overlapping P and D orbitals. The electrons are free to move. The um, atomic cores can slide past one another and still be in contact with all of those free valence electrons. And so um, metals are malleable, ductile. Um, they have high luster because of those overlapping orbitals and they are conductive because the electrons are free to move. So again, Metallic solids are held together by metallic bonds. So again, we're talking about a solid that is held together by intramolecular forces. So they tend to have relatively high melting points, although that depends a lot on what the metal is. They are thermal and electrical conductors and they are malleable and ductile. Okay, so one last category of solids and that is semiconductors. So a semiconductor is somewhere between a conductor and an insulator. It can conduct in certain um, situations. So as temperature is increased, silicon becomes more and more conductive. We can also improve the conductivity of silicon by doing something that we call doping with other elements. So if you think back to um, alloys of metals where we replaced some of the um, atoms of the metal with atoms of another metal, and we call that a substitutional alloy. We can do the same thing with three-dimensional structures of silicon. So with silicon, we have two different kinds of semiconductors. We have what we call N-type semiconductors. When you have an N-type semiconductor, we've replaced one of the silicon atoms with an atom that has more valence electrons than the silicon does. So in this example, we've replaced silicon with phosphorus. So we call these N-type semiconductors and you can remember N-type because essentially it's more negative because it has more electrons. And the additional electrons just make it so that it's actually a little bit easier for all the electrons to travel. We also have P-type semiconductors. And in a P-type semiconductor, we dope with an atom that has fewer 
electrons. And essentially you're creating a little hole there in the structure for electrons to flow through. And so P type semiconductors, we think of as positive semiconductors because they have fewer electrons and they also increase conductivity. These are very um, functional. In fact, when we think about solar panels, it's actually an interaction between N-type and P-type semiconductors and bridging the gap. That's actually what makes um, solar panels work. So um, those are our solid types. I hope that helps. If you guys have any questions, as always, let me know.